Right. All right. Um, hello and welcome everyone to Voices of the Village. My name is Nikki Wilkes. Uh, I'm a co-founder and executive director at Journey Men Institute. And today we are honored and blessed to have a good friend of mine, uh, an author, a speaker, and a youth advocate, Rosalind Wiseman, joining us uh, for an hour of interview and deep dialogue, uh, jumping into some topics that are very much alive in our community. So thank you, Rosalind, for being with us today. Thank you, Nikki, for having me. Yeah. It's good to um, be with you. I feel the same. Uh, and before we drop into uh, some of the content, it feels important for me to just acknowledge and uh, make some space to feel into and uh, sensitize ourselves to the racial injustice that's taking place in our nation and uh, also the actions of uh, folks who are standing up in the face of uh, human rights and civil rights violations, uh, choosing to protest against police brutality and uh, have their voices heard in support of are black and indigenous and people of color uh, in our country who have long faced systemic oppression. So if we could just hold a moment uh, of acknowledgement and silence in honor of those efforts, um, then we'll be able to steer in and, and drop into the topics that we have for the, for the evening. Thank you. So I feel fortunate, Rosalind, as we haven't known each other for a very long time, but uh, because of uh, a shared experience recently, we had a long car ride to get to know each other super well. So um, I'm wondering if you might take a moment to just uh, share a little bit about yourself and your journey to get where you are and uh, perhaps a little bit about Cultures of Dignity and the body of work that you and your team are engaged in. Well, um, I've been working with young people for over two decades, and um, really it's all, it's been about, even if I didn't have the right words for it, it's always been about listening to young people and giving them a voice, um, and I really see myself as a bridge between young people and adults, and, you know, the adults in various capacities who have authority over them, who are educating them, who are parenting them. Um, so I really see young people as the subject matter experts of their life and I work with them to bring their truth up and then we talk to adults. So um, that's, I mean, that's in general what I do, but it, and it's all, and always been, and I've been searching, I think in many ways, um, and only recently in the last maybe three or maybe five, six years, um, have really, really hint, honed in on the principle of dignity, of people's worth being the principle that everything flows through um, and from. And, and that everything about voice and listening and honoring young people's experiences and um, how we work with them in collaboration and partnership is really based on this, on this incredible principle of dignity as apart from respect. And so I've been listening to young people, um, you know, for a long time, writing curriculum, writing books, um, trying to be an advocate in the best way I can. And then about three years ago, I decided to start a company with um, a man named Charlie Kuhn that is called Cultures of Dignity, and that we would do more work that was more systemic um, with schools and organizations um, and with young people. And so that's what I've been really doing for the last three years is just honing in on that. So everything that stems from that, you know, how young people use social media, the articles I write, um, the things I do for parents, everything stems from this one central foundation. Thank you. Uh, and you shared something that has resonated with me ever since I heard it the first time, and it may have been a conversation we had or perhaps in your writing, but um, and correct me if I get it wrong, but that youth are the subject matter experts of their own lives. Is that right? Yeah. Yep. You yeah. got it. Yeah. 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 And I mean, to me, it's, it's profoundly simple and yet often misunderstood. <laughs> so like, why is that so powerful? Because I think that we, because we, our cultures, many of our cultures um, forget about the wisdom of young people and, mm -hmm. um, and we um, oftentimes uh, confuse being older with being an elder. And you can be 
older and not an elder. And I think it's a really important thing to acknowledge. And I also think that one of the things that, at least in Western culture, that we do a lot is we say like, oh, I know what your experiences are. Um, as, and sometimes it's well-intentioned. Um, sometimes it's patronizing and condescending. Sometimes it's well-intentioned about like, I'm trying to relate to you. But when adults say to young people, I know what it's like to be, you know, I was your age once, so I know what it's like to be you. Um, that's never the case because we never know what it's like to be another person. But certainly, certainly, even before COVID and before the thing, the race um, protests and everything that we've been dealing with, like up in our faces, um, thankfully, up in our faces the last couple of uh, weeks that, um, or recently, that um, it, we adults don't, to say to a young person, I know what it's like, we don't know. Because for example, when I was growing up, even Nikki, you're younger than I am, and I think you would can relate to this too, that you grew up with privacy. And you know, young people don't grow up with any privacy today because mostly their parents are the ones that first invade it by taking pictures of them and posting on social media all the time. So, I mean, we had unprecedented, as you know, as well as I do, levels of anxiety and depression on young, about, among young people. Um, so adults don't know what it's like to be a young person. And yet we often will lecture to them um, and without even asking them what the experience is like. And then we're surprised when young people don't really want to listen to us and are angry or irritated um, about how we're talking to them. So they really are subject matter, the subject matter experts of the content of their life. Um, and as the elders, hopefully, that we are, we can frame the values and experiences and wisdom we've collected to be able to be in partnership with them. Otherwise, I think we're wasting everybody's time. Thanks. Oh, that really speaks to me. And yeah, I think I'm, I'm feeling the gratitude in that it was right after my senior year of high school. And I'm very present with this right now as working in the schools and we're approaching that time of graduation. And there's a lot of the grief around lost rituals and such. Uh, but Facebook came out like that year. And so it was really my, my generation and particularly my age group was really the last one that I think really kind of had that last shred of privacy and um, yeah, really feeling the difference of that for you know folks of uh, my generation and older to not really know what it's like to have your whole life recorded with or without your consent and oftentimes having that uh, dictate the way you show up thinking about uh, you know do making a mistake and and having it be you know the subject for uh, bullying or teasing and then thinking about that living in a very different space where it can be repeated and come up again and again and again and really you know maybe spread like wildfire in a way that yeah. it never has before absolutely absolutely um, I'm a big fan of language, and I find that uh, definitions are super important in our work, uh, starting with a foundational understanding. And previously, you shared that you differentiate dignity from respect. And I'm wondering if you could just unpack that a little bit for the audience. Sure. Like, why, why do we separate those, and how are they different? If we could, I believe that if we could separate these two words and think about them constantly in our ways in which we structure our relationships and the way in which we talk to each other, I think would fundamentally profoundly change the way that our entire culture, systems of government, systems of institutions would change. That's how strongly I feel. So now I'm going to give you my argument about why. Um, so, I mean, I think the simplest way that I can explain it is that if, you know, no matter how old you are, if you, you know, a universal truth around many, across many cultures is that, as I sort of mentioned before, referenced before, is that you respect your elders um, and you respect people in positions of authority. So what I want people to do listening to this and watching this is to think about who was the person when you were growing up that you respected. And I would bet any amount of money that the person that's coming to your mind right now might have had a position of authority, might have had a lot of money, might have been, might have been, you know, sort of overtly successful in the way our culture describes and defines success. But that wasn't the reason that you respected them. Um, I'm betting that the reason that you're thinking about this person that you respected is because that person treated others with dignity, with worth. And that there were people that you were growing up, when you were growing up, that had positions of respect that you specifically did not respect because they used their position of authority to not treat people with dignity. Mm -hmm. And and what we consistently do is get very confused and conflate the two words of dignity and respect. And respect means to admire someone's actions and dignity means to be inherently worthy. So respect is earned and dignity is given. So they're very different. 
But what happens is we get really confused about what happens when we're interacting with somebody who has a position of authority or a position of respect, but we are angry at the way that they are behaving because they're abusing power. But we believe because of the position they have that we can't speak out about it because that would be disrespectful to that person. So what we have to do is be able to separate the person from the position so that so there are obviously there's many people in young people's lives who are wonderful who don't totally deserve respect coaches teachers parents people in positions of, of religious leaders because they treat people with dignity but there are also people in children's lives their parents people in their family religious leaders coaches teachers who abuse power and because young people feel like they can't speak out about it because of that position of respect they are quiet it's one of the reasons why people are targeted for abuse because they know that they won't be believed against the person who has more position of power our president our current president is a master at being able to say as abuse other people and not recognize their dignity but because he has a position of respect because of his presidency it took us, it has taken a lot of people a long time to be able, he got away with so much because of this, the conflation we have of the person and the position. So I think it's, you know, it really just because of the, this, you know, current situation, it took such abominable behavior from our president, our current mm -hmm. president, that we were, that you, be, you really begin to see a, like cracks in general of people being able to separate him and his disgusting behavior and what this position of respect that we should always afford the leadership people in positions of leadership so that's you know i've you know sort of small feelings about it but i truly believe that this would fundamentally change the way that we hold people accountable in institutions if we were able to separate these two words mm. i have a story i i feel called to share and it to me it speaks to this it speaks to the to the opportunity and i think the potential of of this recognition and the story is from my youth i think i was 15 at the time and i had uh, been invited to travel to california to play on like a, a select lacrosse team and this was the first time when i had ever been able to do this i grew up kind of lower middle class i didn't really have money for any of this kind of stuff so it was a big deal for me and uh the coach the, the person who was kind of running the whole tournament was the my connection to the whole thing and so we were driving down there and he was teaching me how to string lacrosse sticks in a very particular way. And I made a mistake. I ended up stringing actually several of these sticks the wrong way. And he just took it like he created this moment and he could tell that I was really upset with myself, like that I had was being really hard on myself and I felt like I'd, you know, let him down and he wasn't going to respect me anymore, perhaps. And he looks me in the eye and he just goes, Hey, Nikki, you're still a good person, man. <laughs> <laughs> but you just made a mistake. Like, why don't you start again? And it's it like, I, I laugh when I tell the story too, because to me, it's like such a, like, oh, that was a big deal. But it was like, that was the it's first a big time. Deal. That was the first time a person of authority, like, like just looked at me in the eye and was like, you're still a good person. You made a mistake. And like, I still see the innate goodness in you. And let's try again. Never in my life had ever anybody been able to reach me in that way that I looked up to, that I respected, that I felt like, you know, had that ability to look the other way and, and maybe, you know, not acknowledge the goodness in me, but chose to. And so, I don't know, does that feel like it kind of validates what you're talking Absolutely. about? Absolutely. It's these seemingly small, tiny moments for young people that really change their life, right? Yeah. Where, where you're like, oh, like I, you know, where you go, you could, that moment either could have been like humiliating, like how stupid are you? Mm -hmm. to, hey, you made a mistake. And that's what adults are supposed to do. Adults are supposed to treat young people with dignity so that they can move forward and learn. Um, we never, nobody ever learns by being humili consistently, well, you learn, you learn things about like shame and your own self-worth or lack thereof or anger and resentment and disengagement. And you learn mm -hmm. things when somebody mm -hmm. humiliates you. Um, but you certainly don't connect with that person and you certainly you certainly d cannot and the thing that's ironic to me is 
that we often, if we have this control and compliance model with young people, and especially with boys, and especially people of color, that if we think we are going to control and, com and make them comply with whatever values of honor, respect, integrity, all these words, that, you know, diligence, perseverance, all these things that we love to talk about with young people, that um, they would ever internalize these actual, these intrinsic values or believe us or want to be in relationship with us so that they would try really hard and then be able to have those values that we're saying we want um, if we don't treat them with dignity. Right. It just it just completely befuddles me that, they, that, that that's not so clear with people. And on the other side, what I think you're speaking to is that when a young when a, when a young person feels that they are being treated with dignity by an adult, my experience is they're going to do every they're going to try as hard as they possibly can with whatever it is. They're going to stick with it because they think an adult is there in relation with them. Mm. Yes, it feels like the the foundation for that relationship to build. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I want to follow this thread because I, I know that this is, a, this is a topic that comes up often with parents that we work with. And I know we have some parents on the call now and probably many more who will tune into this with that role. Also other teachers and, and youth advocates and mentors and such who can recognize the barriers to that strong, healthy relationship, and particularly working across generations where we have folks who are, um, you know, maybe not yet an elder, but in their middle adulthood and trying to relate to youth, maybe their own children or just other, other youth in their lives, um, or maybe folks further along that spectrum. Um, we actually have one of our elders from our elders council on this call. So thank you, Jim, for joining us. It's so good to see you. Um, and the piece, I, I guess the thread I'd like to follow is just what are, um, what are those, uh, those, those qualities, in addition to dignity, that can foster that, that core relationship that everything else gets built from? Um, and I'm, I'm specifically curious around, like, if you can identify anything kind of practical and tangible for folks who are, yeah, like, sure. yeah, just struggling well, with that. I mean, I think, you know, there's a couple things that I think are, that are helpful for me to remember um, as far as principles go and principles guide behavior and rules are an extent. This is the way I look at it and frame everything I do with young people around this, that principles guide behavior and rules are an extension of principles. Mm -hmm. So you have to have your principles and then whatever rules come from that are grounded in principles, like the principle of dignity. So, um, and so another principle for me is to be um, easy on people and hard on ideas. And we live in a culture that is actually the opposite, which is hard on people. You make one mistake and you're the worst person in the entire world. Um, <laughs> and easy on ideas, right? Our intellectual rigor about things or, or really like examining like why, you know, what information is coming to us and why and all, the, all those things. We're pretty soft, pretty easy on ideas. And I want to, I think we need to flip the script that we need mm -hmm. to be easy on people and hard on ideas. Mm -hmm. And when we do that as a principle, I think from there we can be like, that's like specific, it's, it's, it's a conceptual principle, but it's really easy to apply when you think about it, when you're interacting with people. So like when you're working with young people and they make a mistake and make, but make a bad mistake. Like what if they, God forbid right now, a kid that you're working with, the people that are watching this, the young person that you adore, um, you know, does something and contributes to the racism on social media that they're seeing. Like, I mean, let's like, God forbid, like a kid you like, mm -hmm. a kid you're in a relationship with does something that contributes to the racism that we're seeing or the degradation of, of and dehumanization of people. And, you know, as, a, as an advocate for young people and somebody who's been in relationship with young people that have made unbelievable mistakes, um, you know, you can take that personally and mm -hmm. it can just, you know, because many of us who are in our in this field, you know, we are we passionately believe in what justice and dignity look like, and we believe in young people and their right to be safe and healthy and all that stuff. And then we have a young person who does something that we just get so angry that it's just so it's just devastating to us. Mm -hmm. Well, if we can, you know, without excusing the behavior, what I know is that there's always an, an, you know, a reason and you have to figure out that reason is of why that young person did what they did. And of course, this, this you know, would, would be relatable to anybody. It's not an excuse and it doesn't excuse, it really doesn't excuse the behavior nor justify it. But we have to understand the context in which decisions are made 
especially with social dynamics in young people, that make them do things that might be contrary to what we want them intrinsically to believe and how they should act. And so if we can be, and that's a way, a concrete way of being soft on people, but hard on ideas. So you're hard mm -hmm. on the idea of what this person communicated, mm -hmm. but you're easy on the person. And that creates the space for that young person to much more easily self-reflect on their behavior and want to do better. Because my experience is when young people are outright rejected after a mistake, they don't, they, they don't, they don't, it's so much harder for them to come back to us because they're ashamed. And then now because of the culture we live in, it's so easy for them to go find a group that will support whatever it is that they did with. And, mm. and that is where we really have a, I mean, there's just so much issues and problems with that. So mm. I just want to use that as an example of like, of we all need to collectively be giving each other a break. And we also need to be in relation with people as they make mistakes so that they can continue to be in our community. I mean, you know, there's obviously, you know, there's a spectrum here where we have to make decisions about stuff where somebody maybe can't for a time of a period. But I think we too often our culture too often will go after a kid and say, no, you're terrible, you're a horrible kid, and not say, wait a minute, we need to understand the context in which that behavior, that decision, that action was made, and maybe what happened in our community that contributed to why that child did that. Um, we just too often are, you know, just go after children. So, you know, or young people, for example. Mm -hmm. So I just, I think that's a, that's one, that, I mean, that's one example of what I look at um, that I think is important, particularly now because of, you know, what we see, what, about how, and how much pain so, much, so many of us are in and how emotionally fraught and frail I think a lot of us are. Mm. Yeah. I'm I'm reminded. Actually, before I go, I just want to say welcome. We've had uh, quite a few other listeners and audience folks drop in since we started. So welcome to Voices of the Village. We're here with Rosalind Wiseman exploring um, some issues and some I want to say opportunities and um, some topics relevant for our audience. And talking right now about um, just how to foster positive relationships across generations, particularly working with young people. Um, and yeah, so I'm reminded of this piece of wisdom, my friend Woody, who's a, he's a, actually a mentor and journeyman with us. And he likes to call those, those moments. And as soon as you describe this example of like a young person who we're really close with and we like them, they do this thing. And then we're just like, oh my, like horrified, right? <laughs> he, he would call that a, a WTF moment, which uh, maybe we could fill in the blank on what we think that means. But for him, it's what's the function. And so... <laughs> It's like, it's like this curious mindset of like, oh yeah. my God, like, why would they share the racist meat? Like, why would they do that? You know, like, I loved this yes. kid. And now, now I'm ashamed. Like, I'm right. embarrassed. Like, oh my God. Right. Like, and you feel like a failure. That. Yeah. Like, what am I even doing? Like, I, I thought, I thought I was doing good work. I thought it was working. I thought we had made progress, whatever. And to hold that space of curiosity and be like, okay, there is some unmet need, right? There's something contextually that I'm not aware of, or maybe I am, and I just haven't been paying attention to that's driving this. What is that? And not to excuse it, but just to be able to follow that thread and figure it out. Okay, what is it that led to that um, and worked in that direction? So really appreciate that. It feels, it really just feels like a broad invitation, not just for those working with youth. I mean, this is culture wide um, and particularly, I think, relevant for anybody who's listening. Um, you mentioned uh, a big part of this, which is shame. Mm. And I, I recently became aware of these tiny guides that you're creating. And I got super yeah. excited about this because <laughs> for, like for me, some of these, I mean, some of these topics are, they're huge. And, you know, people like Brene Brown have, have created like entire volumes and Ted talks and books and podcasts about one of these words. And yet there's also, I think, a need to create some digestible, like, like really key vital info for folks, especially youth and those who are working with youth. Um, what led to the creation of the tiny guides and like, who are those for? Oh my gosh, actually it's like a very dramatic story, I have to say. <laughs> um, so when um, the stay at home order started, yeah. um, I was in Denver and I got, I mean, I live in Boulder as so I was in Boulder and I got incredibly sick. And I don't think I, I don't know. Cause you know, since we can't get tested, um, I don't, I was never tested even though I went to, into the hospital, mm -hmm. um, because I had a weird kidney infection. And, um, so I was horribly sick for two weeks, which, um, I don't, that's not something that I have usually experienced. Thank goodness. 
So while I was gone, the team at Cultures of Dignity, we, you know, our experience always, um, and I really appreciate this about the people I work with, that when um, tremendous amounts of upheaval happen, um, that we tend to listen first instead of putting out all sorts of information. Um, and when the state, when the pandemic, when it was labeled a pandemic, when people started staying at home, like it was like parents were just inundated with like, here's the perfect schedule for your child staying at home, and here's how they shouldn't stay behind, get behind, and all this stuff. And I was really, really, really sick while this was happening. And um, so while I was sick, um, one of the most wonderful people on our team, whose name is Megan Saxelby, who's been who's worked in education for about 15 years had these, this idea and these raw materials of these things called tiny guides that she'd been wanting to do for a really long time. And she came to us, she'd been working with us for about a year and said, I'd really, can we work on these together? I think this might, I've got 18 different ways to describe like the component parts of social emotional skills and shame, anger, insecurity, emotional granularity, emotional hijacking, in these very concrete ways, can we work on them and put them out for people as we're listening to people, excuse me, we're listening to people and what they need. As we're listening, can we start working on them and then be able to put them out um, in a relatively short amount of time? So when I came back and I could basically, didn't have a temperature of like 105 <laughs> when I was able to function, I came back and these wonderful, beautiful, tiny guides had been created. And, um, and I got to work on them too. And we were, and what we found, of course, is that people's bandwidth is like, like this, this wide right now. And, um, and they just, they need something that will say, you know, you're having these enormous feelings right now. Here's how to understand them a little bit better for yourself and for the people that you might be living with right now and the young people in their lives. And that's what the tiny guides are. So there are 18 of them, and you know, three of them are about dignity and the component parts of dignity. Um, and then there are things like shame, like a tiny guide on shame, a tiny guide on anger, on emotional hijacking, on emotional granularity, which is my, I think, my personal favorite. And um, and so they just, it's just like you know, in the shame guide, I think the funny thing, you know, that that the funny, the funniest thing about them, and we tried to make them funny and approachable and relatable, regardless of how old they are is that, you know, nobody ever said to a little baby, like, you know, you're, you know, well, there are some people who do this, but most of us don't say, don't get when they're little babies, like, you're so stupid, you're so stupid, like, when you, when you can't do something because you're a baby. Mm -hmm. And yet, at the same time, like, people don't, like, and people, for the most part, don't judge babies, and they're not mean to babies, like, you're just doing baby things. Mm -hmm. And I think what's really important is that when you get older, you feel like you have to be in connection with people and you care more about how people think about you. And then if you disappoint them or if you are worried about how people are approving of you and if you don't get that approval, which is so inherent to who we are as human beings, then we feel shame. Mm -hmm. And that shame is like, you know, like gets into our head and it just totally messes with us. And then we can get emotionally hijacked, meaning our emotions take over, right? And we can't, we have a really hard time being able to process things or being able to show up the way we want to for ourselves or other people. Right. So it takes these enormous feelings and we can really digest them. And once you digest them and understand them, then they don't have as much control over you. So that's what we're trying to do. And we're trying to do it with these big, big feelings like shame. Yeah. I, I love that. And I, I think, you know, the more, the more and more I, I sift through content that's available in particular, thinking about things that are going to be relevant and digestible, not just for youth who have a very different way of, you know, processing and, and consuming media than older generations, but for parents, teachers, and, and youth workers too, who are like, we're just flooded with content. Like it's, it, there's no shortage of information on any of these topics. And <laughs> it's, yeah. And I think the overwhelming part of that is uh, for me is like being like, okay, when I'm in my less than best state, when I'm, when I'm triggered or when I'm escalated or when I'm off my balance, that's when I need the content the most, right? It's not when I'm all zen out and like totally chill and in my best, then I can access those things. But it's really when I'm not and I, feel like that is the most valuable time to have something that's quick. It's easily to digest. It has kind of the key bits for that right where I need it. Um, and that's kind of, I think why I got excited. I'm like, what a great tool, right? Not just to present for young people, but people who are working with youth and being able to explain these really big topics that interface pretty much every avenue of our life, but doing it in a way that actually feels approachable, accessible. And 
as difficult it is with shame, maybe even a little bit light and fun. Yeah, exactly. You know, I have to say they're very helpful to me too. I mean, in the last week, I mean, I, this is not the first time I felt this feeling, but in the last week, um, you know, I've really felt like as, has anything I've ever done made a difference in any way. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've been working, I've been working for so long on issues of equity and dignity and, um, you know, just, and, and I believe so strongly and tried and I've advocated for young people and people to be able to live a life of dignity and, you know, fighting against sexism, homophobia, the different kinds of isms and bigotry. And, you know, I certainly have phases in my life and definitely early last week of like the forces, the forces against this are, are, have just, they've just, they're just squat. They're just it, it, like, I just felt I couldn't even do it now. Like I just, I was so overwhelmed with this feeling. And, um, and again, it's not the first time I felt this and, um, these feelings are overwhelming and mm -hmm. it's really helpful, even though we do this for a living, right. That I need to check in with myself about like, do I feel shame about like, I haven't done enough. Mm -hmm. Um, I haven't been enough of an ally. Right. And, and like, I mean, I'll be super, you know, super straight up with you, you all, like I came from Washington DC. This is something that's been really on my mind right now. I'm from Washington, D.C. I ran a nonprofit for many years in D.C. Um, I, I moved here about seven or eight years ago. I made a choice to move to Boulder, Colorado, which is predominantly white, um, which really impacted my children and the people that they would be around. And um, it's been really, really, it's been a painful, it's always been bothering me. Like, it's always been something in my heart and in my head since I've lived here. But certainly in the last two months or last month or whatever it is. Um, I mean, it's been like, you know, coming up and coming up and coming up. It's been just like really painful for me. And so, um, you know, these feelings are big and we need to be able to process them. We need to have people that we can talk to about it and we need to have feelings. We need to be able to process them so that they make sense to us and we can keep doing our work. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's just something that I live with myself like every day in practice. And I think that's, um, you know, I think it's the only way to do it. I appreciate your uh, your personal connection and um, to me what feels like a, an example of modeling and, and being vulnerable with where you're at and, and the experiences right. that you've had that have you know led to perhaps a feeling of choosing to continue to do this even though you have those moments when you're like, is this even doing anything? Is this even is right? This, you know, right. every school shooting, the way that every, every, you know, I'll tell you, like every time they re up budgets for, um, you know, looking at schools as if they are, you know, you know, with, as if we're in a war, right? Like every mm -hmm. time, every time that happens after every school shooting, it make, I feel like as anything I do make a difference, right? I mean, it's like, it, there's lots of different ways in which I could be challenged to feel like is anything I'm doing <laughs> making a difference. Um, and, um, but I still do the work, like you still do the work and, um, you know, but we need to have a way to process our emotions, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I'm all to say, I'm affirming like, yes, this is for young people and yes, this is for parents and people who work with, and, but it's also for pe the people that are supposed to be the experts on all of this stuff. I think sometimes we need it more than anybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to, I want to acknowledge too, something you shared, which I think is a shared identity for both of us of being of being white folks uh, attuning a, a into uh, a field in particular that's alive right now. And um, something that's true for me is is a recognition, and this is a growing recognition for me of how shame gets in the way of every other piece of work that I need to do. It gets in the way of me showing up in just my life and in my wholeness, and gets in the way of uh, I think just me being my best as a parent, as a teacher, as an educator. The part of me that tells me I'm not doing it good enough, that I'm just not good enough no matter what, I'm doing it wrong, there's something fundamentally wrong about me. And um, in particular, I, I feel you know curious about how that is uh, preventing white folks from showing up mm. in, in, oh, yeah. in solidarity right now and in, in choosing to even just use their voice and engage in, in what I would call courageous conversation, which is talking about race, which is admitting you know, when we just act out of privilege and don't really, uh, you know, tune into to the to the impacts of our behaviors, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, I'm mm -hmm. wondering, like, I'm wondering, you know, how this shows up in particular in your life and for young people, 
as mm-hmm. I am continually looking to young people in my life for some leadership in this, in this way, I'm wondering how that's been showing up for you as well. Oh my gosh, so many ways. Well, I mean, today, I, um, a colleague and dear, dear friend of mine decided to do um, a webinar that we're gonna actually do, um, I guess, a week from today. And um, it's a woman that I met in Washington when I, she was 25, I think I was, so I was 30, yeah. And, um, and her name is Shantara McBride and we've been working together or working together or working in the same field um, in some way, shape or form for two decades. And um, we were talking about this issue because as a black woman, she's had a number of white women um, acquaintances and friends who have reached out to her with, with various texts that basically say either, how are you? Um, that means people that she doesn't even know that well, like people, like, how are you? Can I send you flowers? Um, can I make you a meal? And um, we were talking about how difficult that often puts the black person in a position of, cause you're like, why, like, what are you talking to me about? Like, wh- how am I how, right? Like. My business has gone, you know, kaput or is really under, is really challenged. I've got some family, you know, family challenges. I've got this, you know, stuff going on in the world. I'm dealing with that all the time. Like, in what way are you asking me? And it, but it also, and I think her point was, was so powerful that we decided to do this webinar next week, is that it really puts the black person in a position of feeling like they have to answer in that moment um because maybe you know they're and you can't offend that person also you can't say like why are you asking me this or like we don't know each other well enough to be talking about this but it made as as i was listening to her talk about the frustration of i have to have this conversation now whether i want to do it or not because maybe the person doesn't want to talk about this ever again or um, this is like my one opportunity and there's such a both both of us have worked so hard on um in all different kinds of ways of women supporting other women and there's such a legacy a complicated legacy of white women contributing to the oppression of black people in this country since this country has been around and since we've had slavery that meaning as long as this country's been around that um that you know in fact a lot of white women don't know about or um and aren't that curious about or don't at the very least don't understand the context in which a question like how are you? Can I send you flowers? Can I make you a meal? Comes across to someone. Mm -hmm. And so that's a conversation that we need to have. And that's uncomfortable because it's that quintessential thing of white people getting uncomfortable with like, oh, you think the worst of me, right? And it's like they can't deal with being uncomfortable with dealing with the complexity of racism in this country um, and how they benefited from it. So all to say, like Shantara and I were really talking about this today and we're like, and the last couple of days. And so we're going to really have a conversation about it a week from today about how two women talk about these issues. And um, I think, you know, for me, it's really caused me, even though I think about these issues a lot, it's also going back to this thing in Boulder, is um, I've been in deep, deep reflection about how moving to Boulder, I got lazy about having multiracial a multiracial organization. Um, I got lazy in ways that I'm really not proud of. And at the same time, what I think is incumbent upon me and in my position of leadership, but also the way I want to live is to be able to say, well, I need to recognize it. I need to affirm it. I need to acknowledge it. I need to do better. And so that's, that's where I'm at. And that's the kinds of conversations I'm having right now. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think that's the least that someone in my position of race privilege can do. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Rosalind. Uh, it's wild that you just, you just shared this example. And um, so I, I just learned a term yesterday, actually, as I was checking in with a, a friend of mine who has actually been someone that I've, uh, I've worked with in a professional capacity uh, in helping to understand racial equity work uh, on a much more deep level. And uh, she asked me, after you know, after we had set a time to just check in with each other and being curious about each other's lives, she says, "Is this a white people check in?" And I was, <laughs> I, I didn't know what that was, and I was like, "I'm white. I am checking in with you, and I don't know." And so I looked it up, right? And what I come to learn is like the pattern that you describe, which is in particular in in times of uh, you know escalated racial tensions or something, then. White folks get, you know, a little bit stirred up and they think, oh my God, I'm going to check in with every person of color that I know. 
completely unaware of the emotional burden that they're throwing out and saying, you need to hold my feelings because <laughs> I'm uncomfortable right now. So can you just make me feel better by letting me know that you're okay? And, you know, in, in that moment, I got to process. I mean, this is very much alive for me too. This was literally yesterday and being like, okay. Uh, and I had to honestly ask myself, is that what I'm doing? Is that what's driving this initiation of, of curiosity and care for my friend? And in this case, in my case, I, I could say like, no, I've been in conversation with this person uh, authentically for longer. And that was, that was the basis. Right. And not some random check-in. <laughs> not random. And, and it is true that, that my own care and concern for my friends of color is heightened right now. Like right. that is also true. And, right. and so like sitting with the truth of both of these things of like, yeah, okay. I am so grateful that I can have this awareness that kind of uh, maybe haphazardly or recklessly you know, throwing out these surface level invitations to check in that seem, you know, again, on the surface about uh, caring for them, they're really not about caring for them. It's really about right. caring for my own uh, feelings around it and right. uh, touching upon a, 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 another big topic of white fragility, being like, right. shit, it's really uncomfortable right. to deal with. Um, right. Maybe yeah. I want to look at that. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've dealt with that much less so, but I've dealt with that um, since you know, well, I mean, I came from DC where there's lots and lots of Jewish people and I'm Jewish and I've certainly dealt with that a little bit more here because there's so much hom homogeneity with people and like, they don't want to offend you. And, you know, where I grew up, like, you know, people are friends in all different kinds of ways. And so, and the mark of friendship is being able to mess around with people with that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, um, and so, because you know, because you know them well enough to be able to do it. And, um, and so I've, you know, seen that of like, and I'm, you know, it's really confusing to me. <laughs> like, um, you know, like, and, you know, as a Jewish person, sometimes being able to make jokes about one's own people. And, um, and I sometimes will do that. And, but when you're in a group of people that don't have any experience like that, then it gets to be realized like, oh, you can't do that. Like, right. So it's all different kinds of cultural norms that it's really, you know, it's a really interesting process, but I, but I honestly mean to go back to where we are right now. I mean, I think the thing that, um, the thing that I'm, I'm maybe, and, and I don't, I'm going to say this and I don't know enough and I need to know more about it. I'm in process. I'm very curious about knowing more. The thing that I'm curious about with young people is, are, because I'm seeing so much incredible, inspiring activism and under, awareness and understanding of the issues that we're talking about amongst young people. But I'm concerned that, and I could be wrong. I really, really could be wrong about this. Um, uh, I'm see so what I've seen so what I'm wondering about is where are the kids in the suburbs like where where is there or where are they with this um do they like are they do they care um I'm seeing and I, I really I'm, I'm not saying this is like I know the answer to it I'm curious about it like mm -hmm. I'm seeing things in very small communities I'm seeing large you know we're seeing large amounts of student activism in large cities um I'm wondering about you know, young people that are sort of in the middle, which which are a lot of young people. And I had a conversation with a young person today that lives, and this is one of the reasons that um, it sparked for me, is that um, I had a conversation with a 15 year old um, young man who's virtually interning. Um, and I, I just, there were, I just was like, wait, where, wh how is he seeing the world? And I'm just curious about it. And I want to get more curious about it. Um, I want to be more curious about once we're seeing this just incredible leadership. And I want, I just want more young people to be in positions of leadership. And I wanted to, I want them, or at least, at the very least, I want them to be knowledgeable and engaged and participating in whatever way they feel is most comfortable. I want them, you know, engaging in what's happening because, what young people are doing in this country is extraordinary. And um, we've got to be able to support it in whatever way possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate that curiosity. It's something that uh, I'm, I'm present with is, you know, the primary place that I teach is, um, I think it fits, it fits the uh, similar demographic that often would be considered suburban, even though it's a rural, it's a rural place mm -hmm. in high school. And, we have a very, I, I would say a very vocal and engaged um, and uh, I want to say subculture. There's a student um, subculture here that is highly, highly engaged 
And I'd say it's also true that generally speaking, um, the student body is not oriented toward a lot of the, the social change movements that are taking place on a broader scale that are, I think, super well engaged with uh, in urban communities and places that I would say are just more exposed to the, the issues that they're trying to change. Yeah. So to me, there's, yeah. a, there's a, an element of being insulated from the effects of it all and perhaps having, you know, parents and home life situations that aren't bringing these topics up often having the courageous conversations at the dinner table and asking, um, you know, yeah. asking curiously about their experiences with things like race and privilege right. and the difficult stuff, right? The really uncomfortable combos to have. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned this, this webinar. I want to make sure that I can just share this. If anyone's listening and wants to participate, is this something I can get a link from you and share yeah, out with folks right. afterward? Yeah, we've, we've just decided today that we're going to do it. So you'll, we'll send out, you know, but yes, um, I think it's going to be at one uh, noon your time mm -hmm. and um, a week from today. And um, they'll be able to open it up for chat, you know, Q&A. Um, and you'll see, you know, a white woman and a black woman who've known each other for a long time talk about how we've supported each other through, um, you know, the, be doing this work, um, how we've, you know, really challenged each other, had really difficult conversations with each other, um, and how we bear witness, um, with each other when we, we can see discrim when we've each experienced different kinds of discrimination or disrespect from people for various reasons. Um, and really, and then connect it to the experiences that we're both individually having um, right now. So, um, but you know, one of the things that I have tried in my career because of the work that I did so much with women is to really hold women, to be knowledgeable about, not blame themselves, but to be knowledgeable about the legacy of how we have been acculturated to express or receive anger. Mm. And um, I think that's a really important issue for black women know this um, and know legacy and history about anger and how, you know, sort of how people have allowed them to express anger in various ways and how the culture has seen their, you know, how when black women can express anger. But there's a whole thing that we don't talk about, about white women and anger and not, and how it can be a struggle, especially for middle class and um, higher middle class women to express anger, that um, to be to getting into this whole trap of like being nice and being kind is actually a code for not expressing what you really feel. Mm -hmm. And, um, and also the thing that I think is incredibly important that white women have an incredibly difficult time dealing with is that when they make a mistake, when they say something racist or they may do something ignorant or when they, when they do something like that and somebody reacts, you know, like a black woman reacts with anger, understandable anger, that all of a sudden, and I can't stand this, but I've seen this more often, I mean, if I had seen it once, it would be too much is to have white women get all teary eyed and cry or feel like, you know, my feelings are hurt because what I said inadvertently offended you. Um, I don't want to take away from people's feelings because feelings are feelings. I'm never going to take away somebody's feelings, but we have to, we have a really literally have a responsibility to understand what we are doing. If you are a white woman and you are crying or you are, you are the one who's upset and needs to be consoled because you did something that was racist or you know, ignorant. And so then you have the person of color who is, has to be in a position or of like consoling you or assuring you that you didn't mean badly. Mm -hmm. that, that kind of stuff is so intertwined with our acculturation of women and anger and what, how we're allowed to express anger and how we're allowed to, how we are acculturated to receive anger, that we're not supposed to hurt people, all that stuff. We got to get way more on our game about this issue because it stops us from being able to have the relationships that we want, that I hope we want. And it stops us from being able to come across and be confident people when we are having difficult conversations. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and it all encapsulates into when usually, this has been my experience, so people obviously can have different ones, where a white woman will say like, I'm just not a conflict person, right? Mm -hmm. And their hands go like this. Well, if you're, first of all, conflict happens and we have to deal with conflict and we have to do it competently and with dignity. But there's a understandable reason why 
so many women feel this feeling of I, I'm not a conflict person because somewhere along the road, they learn someone told them that they could not handle conflict competently. They couldn't stand in a difficult conversation. And so if we can figure that out, then we can support each other in these really difficult conversations about race in ways that we traditionally have not been able to do. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the, if we can do that, that would be one of the things that would be one of the things that would be maybe a slight, you know, a slight benefit of the horrendous experience that people of color traditionally have in this country. Mm. Thank you. That feels so alive given the circumstance <laughs> of all that is happening and you know, I think to me, you're touching upon the intersectionality of, of power dynamics in our culture uh, between the sexes and among the gender spectrum and across the, the racial divide as well. And um, yeah, what comes up for me too is just acknowledging too the, the place of privilege to be able to say, I'm not a conflict person, I'm gonna step out of this. Right. Being like, does right. everybody get to say that? Right, exactly. Um, and right. perhaps not. So I, Oh man, I'm really encouraging anyone. Uh, we're getting some comments in the chat too. Like, if this is alive for you, exciting to be able to drop into that to that webinar. Sorry about this. My <laughs> sorry about that interruption. My mom is FaceTiming me, and I forgot to turn off my notifi notification. So I apologize. Okay. Hi, mom. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah. So opportunity to drop in more deeply into that experience next week. We'll send out a link with some more info. Um. We're getting close to the end of our session, and I want to make space for, uh, at the very end, we'll, we'll go through what we call our high five, which are just like these intuitive sort of quick answers to things. Um, but because I, I feel like there's this really clear shared uh, thread between our, our professional capacities and, and what we focus so much of our time on in working with youth, I'm wondering if you might have uh, one or two just like like highlights or surprises or things that have come upstream from a youth voice. As we started this, you said, you know, one of the, one of the things that you've, you know, chosen to do and felt like is so important is really just highlighting and, and supporting youth voice. Uh, what have you learned recently or what has really been like a, a piece of wisdom from young folks that you're working with that you'd like to mm -hmm. share? Well, today I had a conversation that had, well, two things. One is about the pandemic and the other is just about being a kid. <laughs> um, the first is that, um, and I've heard this a lot, is that um, I was really curious about where young people, you know, hooking up, having sexual interactions with each other during, you know, the stay at home orders. And um, in my, my limited experience thus far has been that um, unless a young person has a direct connection to somebody in their home who's compromised, um, that there has really been no, I think the quote was like, yeah, nothing changed, like people, like maybe they were in smaller groups, but people are still, you know, hooking up, leaving their house and hooking up. Yeah. Um, so I got a very much a confirmation of that today. <laughs> and um, uh, <laughs> that's, that's not surprising though, is it? That didn't surprise you. No, no, no. I mean, oh, okay. about parents who, you know, cancer survivors, like, you know, there's very, to me, there's a very clear distinction between kids who have compromised people at home and they seem to be very like, Yep. I'm not leaving. I'm not going anywhere. And yep. then there are the, you know, but for the most majority of young people, they're going out and they're, you know, hanging out. Um, so that's the first thing. Second thing is um, there's a really, I was listening to a young man today um, talk about something so poignant about um, how I was asking what parents don't understand about boys' friendships. And he said that they don't understand how difficult it is to lose a friendship and build another friendship group back. And um, he was specifically relating it to a situation that when he was in seventh grade, he had a best friend and the best friend and him had gotten, gotten into a fight, an argument. And um, the, the, you know, his, his best friend told his mom some stuff and this kid I was talking to, told his mom some stuff. And the moms got so angry at each other that the best friend's mom forbid his best friend from ever talking to and being a friend of the guy, young man that I was talking to. And so the friendship was essentially over. Like they listened to their parents and they stopped the friendship and it was incredibly painful for him. And, um, and it, and his talking about what it took to find another group of friends and to build the relationship with these people. So that he has like a, you know, a tight group of friends again, 
was painful. And I don't think parents, I think what happens is parents get so fixated on the anger that they might feel towards this other child or so fixated on the argument that they think the children are having that, um, and their own baggage about it, that they don't realize the larger implications and context with which that they're putting their own child in about the, about friendship. And it really just struck home for me how important, I mean, I know this, I've written about it extensively, but it, it really struck home for me today about how important friendships are for boys and how difficult it is to build friendships. Um, and, and that's why, it, you know, like, and that sometimes it's easy to devalue them or to not see them as as important as boys see them. So that was just a really, it was a really poignant story and experience that this young man shared with me today um, that I really appreciated and really like, you know, held space for. Thank you. Oh, that feels really close to home. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think I want to empathize too, like with the parent mindset, like mm. probably, probably operating from a place of, of trying to support your child, like thinking totally. that, thinking that that is, well, I need to protect or I need to take care and I really want to help. And totally. Um, in that kind of myopia, like just so nearsighted and that not recognizing the bigger picture of what else is happening. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I've been there. I'm sure I'm, uh, yeah, me too. Thank you. Um, so as we uh, get ready to close, I want to also acknowledge a few other ways folks can engage with your work. Um, you've written quite a few books, uh, a couple in particular that might be, feel relevant for folks of teen or parents of teens, uh, Queen Bees and Wannabes being one and Masterminds, Wingmen and help me, is it Masterminds and Wingmen? Yeah, that's the boys book for adults. Yeah, boys book guide, for adults, which is the book for boys that I, I wrote with boys for boys. Got it. Yeah, and yeah, encouraging folks to to grab a copy of one, especially as we still have stay at home orders up here in Washington. We've moved into this really interesting limbo time. We're still in a phase that is not allowing social interaction, but they didn't move us into phase two. They put us in phase 1.5. Oh. <laughs> so uh, in Washington, we're still mostly staying at home. So there's yeah. quite a few uh, book yeah. hours in the day. Yeah. Um, and we'll share out links to some of uh, your tiny guides and opportunities to engage in this webinar and stuff after the call as well. So yeah. Wonderful. Um, yeah. And yeah, thank you. As as we already closed, I want to say thank you, Rosalind. It's such a, it's always a, a pleasant experience for me getting to dive into these topics, and very very grateful that we got to know each other uh, so much better a couple months ago, uh, oh at, at the Wild Mind Diversion down in California. Yeah, so happy, so happy that I got to do that. Yes. Yeah. Um. Okay. So for the final part of our sequence today, we're going to drop into what we call the high five. These are like super quick intuitive answers first thing that come to mind and um some of them might be funny some of them might be a little more vulnerable okay. and the first one i'm going to change because you don't know uh my co-founder we typically do it with him and i for the first subject matter but you and i both know charlie so i'm going to swap in charlie for alex and we're okay. going to use the same question all right okay he's okay. my co-founder okay he's, right <laughs> <laughs> so, um, number one is, would you rather fight one giant Charlie or a hundred tiny Nickies? Oh my God. Would I rather fight? Is yeah, you have to fight. You have to fight one giant Charlie or a hundred tiny me. Uh -huh. Me's. Is oh that correct? Me's. I think me's. one, I think one giant Charlie. You're going with one giant Charlie? I'm going with one giant Charlie. All right. Cool. I'm going to let him know that you said that. Okay. I'm sure you will. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. What is the first word, image, or memory that comes to mind when you say the word manhood? Oh, that's such an interesting thing. Okay. The first memory that came to my mind, which really surprises me, is, um, is um, running, doing a big wheel race when I was about five years old down at the hill in, of my house um, with my, um, with all the boys in my neighborhood. Like it was me and all the boys in my neighborhood and I was incredibly focused on beating them. Nice. That's and a big, big wheel race. Mind. I don't know why. Wow. Big wheel race. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, what is one thing that's been nourishing your soul lately? 
Definitely the outside because, you know, I get to live in, this is the thing, right? It's like I live in this beautiful, beautiful part of the world. So definitely being outside. Mm -hmm. The sky, the trees. I'm looking at them right now through my window. Uh, name one of your most humbling moments. <laughs> <laughs> well, I could show you them. The, I have two sons that are in the back and um, mm -hmm. they're definitely my most humbling ongoing experiences. Yeah, and they're in the home right now, so they get to remind you all the time. Yes. <laughs> nice. Awesome. All right, final one. Uh, a piece of wisdom you would tell your teenage self. Mm, I would say, um, mm, there's so many things, but um, what would I say? I would say um, obligation is not everything. Hmm. Nice. But I have others. I have lots of things I would tell myself, my teenage self. But right now, that's I think that's through. what I would say. At this moment, that's what came. Nice. That's what we want. Um, cool. That's our high five. Rosalind Wiseman, thank you so much for choosing to share your evening with us and your wisdom and much of your experience that you have working with youth. And um, really hoping that anyone listening chooses to go and check out culturesofdignity.com. Um, for those of you working with youth as a parent or educator or coach in any capacity, um, definitely check out the tiny guides, these little uh, bits of wisdom that are nice digestible forms and put in a, I think, a, a way and a format that's going to be really valuable for folks who are out there, boots on the ground, um, engaged in the work. And yeah, nominating to your webinar next week. Um, and that's with your friend, remind me of her name. Shantara McBride, and we're going to be doing it at um, 12 o'clock Pacific time next week, this time next week, this um, Tuesday next week. Perfect. Well, we'll share okay. the link out in our community and encourage um, folks to participate if they're feeling particularly Wonderful. called to that topic. But Wonderful. Yeah. On behalf of Journeymen, and um, thanks to the village, thank you for being here, Rosalind. It's an thank honor. You. Thank you so much, Nikki. You do incredible work. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, good night, everyone, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next time on Voices of the Village. Good night, everyone. Mm -hmm.